Well, welcome everyone to our foot and mouth disease webinar for the dairy industry. Um, I'd just like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging and extend respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people online with us today. Thank you all very much for joining. We've had over 1600 people registered for today, which really highlights what an important issue this is for the Australian dairy industry. We know and understand the threat of FMD entering Australia is something the entire dairy industry is extremely concerned about. And many people across the industry have been working hard on the issue to ensure we are able to get relevant information out to industry. A lot of this information can be found at our new webpage at www.dairyaustralia.com.au forward slash EAD preparedness. We will post the link to this website, web, website now in the chat for you all. Now, for quickly for some housekeeping, please note that this webinar is going to be recorded and will be circulated via email along with being made available on the Emergency Animal Disease Preparedness webpage we just shared. There's also a Q&A button available at the bottom of your screens, and I encourage you all to submit questions at any time throughout the webinar. Your questions will come through to Ash Hammond, who many of you will know, and she will facilitate a 15-minute Q&A following the presentations. Uh, please understand that while it's unlikely that we'll be able to, to answer all of the questions submitted during the webinar, we will be documenting them all and we'll look to address these through the, through the FAQ section on the Emergency Animal Disease webpage provided to you just now. I encourage you all to have a look at the website now for more information too. Answers to your questions may already be there. Um, I'll also flag that this is merely the first of what we expect to be a series of information sharing exercises for the dairy industry on this matter. Undoubtedly, we will run more sessions like these as the issues evolve and more information comes to light. So to introduce the session today, I wanna to briefly pass over to Rick Gladigal, President of the Australian Dairy Industry Council uh, to introduce the webinar. Over to you, Rick. Thank you, Charlie, and welcome everybody along today to, uh, to certainly the, an important occasion in discussing foot and mouth disease and what's been going on in the industry. The industry certainly has been well working with everybody uh, right along from a long time. We were originally started with LSD, which still isn't out of the picture, but certainly FMD has come front to mind now. So from our ADF, ADPF, and as well as DA, we have certainly been at the forefront of been what's going on. <clears throat> For those who don't know, I am a dairy farmer myself, so I certainly get the concerns that are going, that people are feeling on farm and how that risk is, is a possibility. Uh, hopefully it's not going to happen, but, but certainly understand. And, and I've been going through a few sleepless nights myself of just what does it mean. Um, but hopefully today, I think you're going, given the, the level of presenters that we have here in, in Chris Parker from DAF, um, Stephanie Bourne from Dairy Australia and Justin Tui as well, from, uh, who, who does AHA as well as works for ADF, um, you'll certainly gain a lot more information today that you better take away and get a clear understanding of, of what has been going on. Um, a lot has been happening. It's been constantly evolving, especially this week. We've certainly seen a lot uh, of, of changes that have been going on. And of course, the, the media piece of, of what that, um, even though it was, wasn't live virus, but, but those types of issues that are, that are front and center of what we're doing. So I hope you all gain much needed information today from this and I wish you all the best on your own farms and uh, as Charlie said we certainly will run more of these webinars as time goes on as well so I wish you all the best and, and thank you. Thanks very much Rick. Um, so to get us underway I'd like to firstly introduce you to Dr Chris Parker, Head of the National Animal Disease Task Force within the Federal Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry and Chris will provide an update on the government's response to the current biosecurity threat. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, really good to uh, be here and participating in this. I, I think this is about the uh, 
fifth or sixth one of these that I've done across a range of industries, and uh, it's really good to be joining you today. Um, I thought what might be useful, Charlie, is we just have a quick discussion around what these diseases are. Um, lumpy skin disease was uh, detected in Indonesia in March. Um, the department stood up a task force of which I'm the uh, head of that task force. And uh, we started work on a uh, national preparedness plan. The national preparedness plan went through a number of iterations. Um, we've had three uh, quite large uh, uh, round tables with industry and state governments around uh, the activities within that preparedness plan. Um, and uh, and that's, uh, those preparedness activities are uh, progressing really well. And we're starting to get a very clear understanding of the work that's going to be involved also the work that's already been done in the lumpy skin space. Um, clearly in, uh, in, in May, uh, we saw the diagnosis of uh, foot and mouth disease in, uh, in Indonesia. Um, that necessitated uh, our belief given what appeared to be quite an uncontrolled nature of that, uh, that infection, that we need to step up measures uh, at the border. Uh, those measures were stepped up um, and uh, we then saw in July, early July, the uh, announcement of it being in Bali and that necessitated for us a further step up. Um, I've had this question asked to me many times um, and it's around, we've been dealing with countries around the world who have had FMD and we've been doing that for many, many years. And in fact, you could argue that's why the biosecurity system or the quarantine system that once was, um, was set up. Um, really, the difference with Indonesia is, is at the moment um, it's uh, it's it's uncontrolled, and uh, the Indonesians are putting a significant amount of work into controlling that disease. But while they're doing that, uh, the government's had some uh, uh, views, and I think those views are shared by most in industry that we need to be stepping up uh, the activities we're doing for more at the border. Um, these two diseases are similar um, but different. Uh, they're similar in the fact that. Uh, both of them will affect, uh, have a high morbidity, meaning a large number of animals will get infected and they have a low mortality, means usually a, a low number of animals will be uh, will die from these diseases. That's a little bit different to something like African swine fever in, uh, in pigs, which has both a high morbidity, lots of animals get it, and a high mortality, most who get it die. So just so we can understand, so the other reason they're similar is um, whilst they don't have a, a significant uh, mortality, they do cause uh, significant drops in production. And particularly for the dairy industry, is that relevant because uh, both of them have uh, particular effects uh, given animals are ill with fever as far as uh, milk production dropping off. And certainly the experience of the dairy industry in Indonesia, uh, there's been a significant uh, reduction in the amount of uh, milk being produced uh, from the dairies that do exist, even though there's not that many of them there. Um, the other thing that these diseases are similar about it, both have significant negative trade effects for Australia. Uh, lumpy skin disease, uh, we've estimated just in the first year, uh, would cause a loss of about $7.4 billion worth of trade. Um, and foot and mouth disease, I'm sure you've all seen the figures, $80 billion over 10 years. So these are significant trade uh, restrictive diseases for us. And uh, I can tell you, you spend every waking hour and probably some of the sleeping ones doing everything we can, certainly do everything I can to make sure this disease is uh, kept out of, uh, of Australia. So that's a bit of a background of these, uh, these particular diseases. And now it's probably worth me going through um, how we are responding um, as a federal government. Um, reminding everyone, of course, that uh, 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 biosecurity is a shared responsibility. And as the minister has said on many occasions, he's stepping up um, and we're stepping up to ensure that we are doing our part um, in that shared responsibility. So I'll talk about this in three, mat, 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 uh, three ways. The first is what we're doing pre-border. The second is what we're doing at the border. And the third is what we're doing post-border. So pre-border is the work we're doing in Indonesia. Um, and uh, last week, the minister actually visited Indonesia, met with the agriculture minister and the disaster minister, um, and, uh, and also met with uh, a range of Indonesian industry as well as uh, those uh, in Australian industry. Fiona Simpson from the National Farmers Federation uh, accompanied me on that visit, along with uh, a number of senior officials. The work we're doing in Indonesia, uh, we provided uh, lumpy skin vaccine quite early, um, and that lumpy skin vaccine is being rolled out. We provided uh, just very recently a million doses of foot and mouth disease vaccine, and that vaccine is being rolled out. Um, and we provided a number of other technical support. 
around their ability for their labs to cope um, and that work's being done. Support uh, epidemiologically uh, as far as disease mapping and uh, what that might look like. Um, support in uh, their desire to produce vaccine locally and we've uh, identified technical experts to be able to provide them with assistance. And the minister announced last week um, a $14 million package of which $5 million is going to Indonesia um, on top of uh, the vaccine that we've already provided. And of course, then there is a, a, another component um, that's being delivered around, uh, along with MLA in a joint industry government move around um, biosecurity uh, education and the biosecurity, particularly some in the feedlot industry. So that's, if you like, a quick pricey of what's happening pre-border. What's happening at the border um, is, uh, is twofold. Um, the main risk for this is actually, for foot and mouth disease, is actually product coming in. There is a risk associated with footwear and clothing from travellers, but it's not that high. The main risk associated with it is any products that they may bring in that might carry the disease. However, given the active infection going on in Indonesia, and given the large numbers of travellers, particularly over the last few weeks with school holidays and those going to Bali and returning from Bali, we saw a significant uptick in the work being done at the border. So when it was first diagnosed in Indonesia back in May, this is foot and mouth disease now, we put in place uh, increased uh, uh, awareness at the border with our officers, increased profiling and increased uh, uh, questioning of those coming back from Indonesia and ensuring that people were uh, declaring. When it was found in Bali, we had another uptick and, um, and that uptick involved uh, all what I've just said um, again, including having biosecurity officers meet incoming planes and playing a second message. I'm sure those of you who've traveled overseas are aware, top of descent, there's a biosecurity message played by an airline. Now, when you land, a biosecurity officer actually boards the aircraft before people can get off and plays a more specific message, another one, in regard to the specific risks around FMD and having traveled to Indonesia and people's responsibilities to ensure that they are declaring things, their footwear is clean, all those sorts of things. That's on top of all the officers that are there at the border and those questioning um, and, uh, and working their way through what needs to be done to ensure that we're dealing with that risk at the border. So the government's provided another uh, $9 million um, and 18 extra officers, and I don't suspect that's going to be the end of it. Um, and uh, we continue to implement those uh, improved and uh, escalated mes um, uh, measures at the border to manage that. We then, of course, have post-border activities, and, and I see Justin on, and hello, Justin, how are you? Um, and I know that you're engaged uh, very actively on behalf of the dairy industry and all the preparedness activities with Animal Health Australia around the AusVet plan and all those, all those bits and pieces, if God forbid this was ever to get in, um, and how a disease incursion may be managed. What we're doing in that space is ensuring that we've got appropriate assurance around what's happening with product coming in. And you all would have seen in the press, the uh, discovery had in some product both. So we do two lots of testing. The first is we test product we seize at the border and we saw um, an FMD positive in that, not unexpected. Um, and we also do, uh, uh, we buy product um, out in supermarkets um, that we think mm, it doesn't look quite right. Um, and, uh, and that product is tested. Um, and that was the results that uh, the minister publicized uh, uh, earlier in the week. Um, that was 74 products and one of them uh, looked like it had viral fragments uh, for FMD. Um, created quite a bit of excitement, but let me put it in perspective. It's work we do all the time. We found FMD and in this case, we also found African swine fever fragments. We found both of those viral fragments before. They are not unusual. The product that this was in is a shelf stable product, which means it must have been heat treated. And that's why we found viral fragments. Those viral fragments can't infect animals. However, we decided that we would remove that product from the shelves, including tracing back to uh, 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 um, uh, warehouses and making sure we picked up all that product because it wasn't clear to us that that product had, been, had the appropriate documentation to show us it had been imported appropriately. Um, that's part of an ongoing compliance investigation. And to be blunt, I'm not going to answer any more questions in regard to that um, because I don't wish to uh, jeopardise in any way um, a, a, a compliance investigation into what are the circumstances, exact circumstances around that product. 
I am not saying that it was illegally imported. There is a potential it may have been, and that's what's being investigated. And I can tell you, if we find that it has been, there are fines of over a million dollars. There could be 10 years in jail. There could be a whole range of pretty severe penalties that are implemented. Um, the other thing that uh, uh, there's a fair bit of uh, angst around is uh, the person that we found the uh, meat product that tested positive for FMD, everyone's going, well, why didn't they receive a huge fine, et cetera? Um, we want people to declare. If we don't have people declaring because they're scared, then we're really doing ourselves a disservice. So our message is around declaring. This person had declared. Um, this person was questioned further and declared more material at the time, they were given a warning and that was an appropriate response by the biosecurity officer at the time. If people hadn't declared they're lying um, and they do get the card and you also, uh, they do get the fine and you would have also seen possibly quite a bit of uh, uh, activity on social media around an individual who was fined in Perth, $2,664 um, uh, for bringing in uh, chicken meat and lettuce in a sandwich. And I think that, you know, we do implement these fines at the border. Um, and if you're a foreign citizen, um, we're actually able to, in uh, circumstances of uh, uh, really bad transgressing, uh, being able to remove uh, uh, those persons' visa and they can be uh, put out of the country. So um, that's uh, where we are in a, uh, in a Commonwealth uh, response sense. And I thought I'd try and answer, um, uh, Charlie, just a couple of those things that have been floating around. But um, probably uh, I'd rather uh, ask give a bit more time for the question and answer so I won't rabbit on any further, uh, other than to say um, the Minister is incredibly focused on this. The Department and uh, the Secretary, who's the Director of Biosecurity of this Department, is incredibly focused on this. Um, and, uh, and we continue to uh, throw resources at this issue to ensure that we're meeting our responsibilities to keep people safe. Thanks very much, Charlie. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, as you say, that's a great summary of what is an extremely complex response going on in government and a lot more detail behind that, but I think that's given a good flavour on what's going on. So next off, we have Dr. Steph Bullen. Uh, Steph is a dairy cattle vet veterinarian and national lead for animal health and fertility at Dairy Australia. And Steph will give us an overview of what dairy farmers can do right now to increase to increase biosecurity measures on farm, which I know from the questions coming in is already a key question on everyone's mind. So over to you, Steph. Great, thanks, Charlie. Um, so thanks everybody for joining. Uh, so the focus of my session today is really just to run you through uh, some of the key things that you can do to protect your farm. So within Dairy Australia, uh, I work predominantly in the research, development and extension side of the business, um, but we also have a specific policy team of which uh, Charlie and Ashley, who you've met uh, on that team, and they work closely with Australian dairy farmers and the relevant authorities um, and Chris as well um, on some of the bigger picture things that Chris has already spoken about. And Justin's going to talk more specifically about what would happen in the case of a, an emergency animal disease incursion uh, next. So as I said, the, the focus for my session really is on farm. Um, and as Charlie said, it's just a first cut um, of what you need to be thinking about now. Um, and there will be more information uh, to come out soon. So all the information uh, that I'm going to discuss today uh, is available on Dairy Australia's Emergency Animal Disease Preparedness page on the Dairy Australia website. So on the screen, you can see that um, the quickest way to get to that page is dairyaustralia.com.au forward slash FMD. Now, I actually feel pretty lucky uh, to be bringing this to you. And I really care about uh, this, not just because it's my job to care, um, but because we also have a dairy farm in Nambrook. And this is a photo of our herd uh, that I just took a couple of days ago. I wanna be very clear that my presentation today isn't about putting the onus for FMD control onto you as farmers, but realistically, the measures that we put in place on our farm are largely the only things that we as individuals and individual businesses really have control of. So one of the first and foremost things that you can do is very clearly understand the signs of both foot and mouth disease and lumpy skin disease and know what to do. So the first signs that you might detect on farm could actually be relatively subtle and non-specific. 
So it could be a group of sick cows um, or even a single sick cow. It could be a cow off her milk or not eating. Um, it could also be a lame cow or it even could be a sudden death, particularly in calves for foot and mouth disease. Now I have to make it very clear that these aren't photos of emergency animal diseases, but I really just wanted to highlight that some of the early signs of these diseases are pretty, could be pretty nonspecific. So what happens if you uh, suspect um, or, or you're concerned about your animals? Um, you might draft her out to take a bit of a closer look. So, so let's say you've, you've noticed a cow in the herd that you're a bit concerned about. Um, if you've got FMD, uh, one of the things that you may see is blisters on the tongue and in the mouth. So in this case, um, you can see here uh, the blisters on, on the back of the tongue there. Um, or on the dental pad, as you can see um, in that photo, um, or even more subtle blisters like the tongue uh, of this animal. So this is really early FMD blisters that haven't burst yet. Um, and because these blisters are actually quite painful, often the affected animals won't eat. They drool excessively. And that's why you'll see some of those subtle signs that we, we spoke about earlier. An important one for dairy farmers that perhaps hasn't been touched on much uh, in some of the other uh, webinars is uh, that you may also see these blisters on the teats of affected cows when you're milking. Um, and this is a photo taken in Nepal by one of my colleagues, Greg Duncan, uh, while he was on an FMD training course in Kathmandu. Um, as the name suggests, foot and mouth disease doesn't just affect the mouth. Um, and one of the one of the initial signs you may see is, is lameness. So if you pick up the foot of a lame cow, you may see blisters and sores on the feet. Um, and this photo here is, is a photo of an FMD lesion. You may also see uh, lesions around the coronary band at the rear of the claw or even uh, between the claws here. Um, and you could even see signs around the front of the claws. So as you can see from these pictures, particularly the lesions on the feet can look a lot like many of the other lameness conditions that we typically see on farm. Um, and if you see anything at all that looks even remotely suspicious for FMD, it's just so, so important that you call the emergency animal disease hotline. So that number has been on the screen for my last few slides. Um, please stick it in your phone. The phone number is 1800 675 888. One of the things that I really want to emphasise um, is that by calling the emergency animal disease hotline number, it doesn't automatically mean that your animals are going to be destroyed. What it does do, though, is trigger, triggers a response in terms of coming out, testing that animal, and in, in the best case scenario, actually ruling out FMD. There's nothing silly about being cautious um, and there's nothing wrong with having a negative result. It's actually a good thing um, because it helps to strengthen our disease-free status internationally. So it's this careful monitoring and reporting that will allow FMD to be picked up and can contained rapidly um, in the unfortunate event that it does come into Australia. Getting it contained and under control as soon as humanly possible really is the is one of the most important ways that we can minimise the impact of FMD on our livestock industries. So um, FMD is extremely contagious, and I think those of us that have been following the media uh, realise that. Um, in fact, it's one of the most contagious animal diseases that we know. Um, as a consequence, it can be readily spread from farm to farm on vehicles, equipment, clothing, um, anything really that's contaminated with manure, milk or other animal fluids. Um, and so I put up the picture of the milk tanker here because one of the key call outs and one of the things that I want you to take home from this session, if nothing else, is keeping tanker tracks um, clear of animals. Tanker tracks are absolutely a no-go zone for animals. Um, so um, I've, I've talked about vehicles, equipment and clothing, but close contact between live animals or susceptible animals, um, such as over the fence, um, uh, or by introducing new stock onto your farm is still one of the most important sources of transmission from farm to farm. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Really importantly, foot and mouth disease is not considered a threat to human health. So a quick note on pigs. Um, Chris did mention that animal products are really one of the highest risks for FMD coming into Australia. So I wanted to talk to you very quickly about pigs. Um, I know that some dairy farmers have got pigs um, as a bit of a side hustle. So just wanted to, to call out a couple of things there. So the feeding of table scraps to pigs was the likely source of the, the devastating uh, FMD outbreak in UK in 2001. 
Um, it's a really high risk for an outbreak in Australia too. So for this reason, um, feeding pigs swill, uh, which is essentially food scraps, bakery waste, restaurant waste, um, cooking oils or other food waste is illegal in Australia for that reason. So just don't do it. Um, so I know a lot of the focus has been on FMD, um, but I do want to touch very briefly on lumpy skin disease too. Um, and it has been a little bit lost in the media uh, with the FMD swarm. Um, but lumpy skin disease is another emergency animal disease. And as Chris said, it's also been detected in Indonesia recently. It's spread predominantly through biting insects and the movement of infected animals um, from, unin uh, from infected areas into uninfected areas. Um, like FMD, some of the early signs are, can be a bit nonspecific. And in the case of lumpy skin disease, uh, discharge from the eyes and nose, uh, weight loss and reduced milk production are often the first things that you'll see. Um, but as you can see from the photos there, uh, really kindly sourced from uh, Animal Health Australia, um, affected animals develop lumps in their skin, particularly around the head and neck. So I know we've covered a lot uh, and there's a fair bit to remember. Um, so what we've done is developed these uh, A3 waterproof posters for you to put up in your dairy, uh, which highlight the key things that you need to be looking for. These and all of the other resources that I'll talk about today uh, will be available from your regional Dairy Australia regional teams. So now that you know what to look for um, and what to do if you suspect anything and who to call, uh, let's come back to Nambrook, which is uh, my farm here in the McAllister Irrigation District. So good uh, dairy farm biosecurity really is your best defence against FMD coming on farm. Um, and it's a really good idea to try and limit your property access points and get yourself uh, a biosecurity sign and stick it on the entrance way. So this one here is a reflective stainless steel one I got made for our farm privately. Um, but you can also obtain free core flute ones from your Dairy Australia regional teams in the next week or so. Um, and I know that in some states, uh, New South Wales, particularly, um, you can get them from local land services or other um, departments. So just check in with your local departments and see if you can get them from there too. But really what I'd love to see is every dairy farm in Australia having uh, a sign like this one on their entrance ways. So um, on to, to biosecurity and biosecurity planning. I'm really hoping that everyone on the call has at least seen something like this. Um, so this is a biosecurity plan and I, I'm pretty hopeful that you've got one already. If you don't um, or you haven't looked at your plan for a while, now is the time to do so. Uh, there's several options to choose from in terms of biosecurity plans. So to keep things really simple, at Dairy Australia, we're recommending that you use the Animal Health Australia Biosecurity Plan or app. And the reason for that is that it's really simple and we feel that it's probably the most appropriate for emergency animal diseases. You can either download uh, the Farm Biosecurity app um, from either the App Store or Google Play um, or download it in a PDF form from the Dairy Australia um, Emergency Animal Diseases page or you can even get a hard copy um, with a nice little waterproof folder uh, from your Dairy Australia regional team in the next week. Um, one of the things that I've, I'm on social media and I see lots of the discussions on various different groups around uh, foot baths um, can, can say for a fact that they've been a pretty pretty hot topic. And I did see a couple of questions come through on the chat uh, asking about appropriate disinfectants. So what I want you to remember is that foot baths alone are not going to protect your farm from an emergency animal disease. They need to be used in conjunction with a whole lot of other biosecurity um, measures that hopefully you'll identify by working through your biosecurity plan. As I said earlier, uh, mud, manure, dirt, all reduce the effectiveness, um, oh, sorry, mud, manure and dirt, um, all reduce the effectiveness of the chemicals that we use in foot baths. So you need to scrub your boots with uh, water and detergent first to remove any gross contamination, then disinfecting your chosen chemical. Um, it is important to um, ensure that you're using the right chemical and a chemical that's effective against FMD. So I've specifically put here a QR code and I'd encourage you to quickly whip out your phones and scan the QR code. Um, this links to an APVMA list of products uh, specifically for disinfection against FMD. And it includes the dose rates and some of the precautions around safety and, and other things such as corrosiveness, et cetera. Um, I think it goes without saying, you do need to check the label and the dose rates. Um, 
all disinfectants uh, need contact time to work. So don't wash it off your boots after you apply it. And finally, um, you do need to regularly refresh those foot baths um, to ensure that the chemical stays active. And I am on farm next week uh, to film an instructional video um, to support this information and that will be available on the Emergency Animal Diseases webpage as soon as possible. Uh, so uh, in terms of traceability, um, we know that this is really critical in terms of being able to uh, uh, halt a, a, an outbreak as soon as possible if, if FMD was unfortunately to come uh, into Australia. So Dr. Megan Stock, uh, Scott from Agriculture Victoria sent me through this image earlier in the week. Um, in blue, uh, you can see the stock movements into Victorian sale yards um, and in red out of Victorian sale yards. And that was just in a six day period last week. Being able to re uh, produce this information and accurately is just so critical uh, in order to rapidly contain an outbreak. And it really highlights why the NLIS system is so important. We do know that there are still lots of instances where the NLIS, NLIS processes aren't done well. Um, and I really urge you as, as farmers and as industry stakeholders to do your bit to make sure we get this right. Um, and that includes, you know, correct use of, ta uh, of the NLIS tags and vendor declarations. So in terms of uh, overseas travel uh, staff and visitors, um, so I can tell you that uh, David Inall and his team at Australian Dairy Farmers, as well as the Dairy Australia Trade and Strategy team have been working really hard with the relevant government authorities to make sure our industry concerns and needs are being heard. But remember that the purpose of my presentation is really just focusing on what we can control on farm. Um, and to protect our farms, DAF has recommended that anyone that's traveled to Bali or Indonesia doesn't come on farm for at least seven days after returning. We've actually gone a fraction further and we are recommending that this should extend to any countries that are not uh, declared FMD free. So there's a list of these um, FMD free countries. So the exclusions, those countries are listed on the Emergency Animal Diseases website. Um, so countries like New Zealand, the UK, Canada, among others are okay. Um, but if the country doesn't appear on the list, we suggest, suggest that you really do take extra care. In addition, uh, it's part of a sound biosecurity plan uh, that you have all visitors and staff um, that come on farm complete a risk assessment. So uh, they'll either be um, low, medium or high risk. And if they're either medium or high, uh, manage those visitors accordingly. Um, so this in, uh, extends to, to people like milking machine technicians, stock feed delivery trucks, vets, factory field officers and, and the like. And I know there's quite a few service providers on the call. Uh, what I would suggest is that if the farm that you're visiting doesn't do a visitor risk assessment, uh, that you do one yourself. And again, downloadable from the Dairy Australia EAD website um, and complete a risk assessment and provide that to the farm that you're visiting. Um, so in terms of more information, uh, I've mentioned this a couple of times, but Dairy Australia does have an emergency animal diseases um, uh, preparedness page. Um, and everything that I've mentioned in today's presentation is available on that page. The website is www.dairyaustralia.com.au forward slash FMD. And it, as well, um, the hard copies of all these resources, including biosecurity gate signs, the waterproof posters, uh, biosecurity plans, uh, will all be available from your Dairy Australia regional teams in the next week or so. And I really wanna, again, highlight that this is just the first stage um, of our response to this. And we're working incredibly hard behind the scenes to make sure we continue to bring the information and tools that you need to keep your farm safe. So Charlie, just to wrap up, um, the things that I spoke about today, uh, make sure you know the signs and where to report and report anything suspicious at all. Um, update and enact your biosecurity plan and that includes doing visitor and staff risk assessments, um, keeping animals off tanker tracks, can't emphasize that enough um, and using foot baths correctly. Um, and finally, continue to do good work under the NLAS. Um, if either foot and mouth disease or lumpy skin disease make their way into Australia, we'll be able to pull them up as quickly as possible and really try and minimise the impact on our industry. Uh, and on that, back to you, Charlie. Thanks very much, Steph. That is excellent, an excellent rundown. Um, 
So next off, we have, finally, we have Justin Tui, our expert advisor for the Australian dairy farmers on animal health, welfare and biosecurity matters. And Justin will speak to us about the implications for the dairy industry in the event of a disease incursion, including an overview of what is likely to occur in the instance of a livestock standstill. Thanks very much, Justin. Thanks, thanks, Charlie, and thanks, uh, Steph, for an excellent presentation on the practical nature of this disease um, or the emergency animal diseases. I'm going to focus my talk on FMD, uh, so not touching LSD, and really cover uh, uh, quite a bit to do with the documentation and the process through which the industry goes in, in reaction to a finding. So, um, why is that? I'm sorry, I'm just trying to advance. There we go. So, what I'd like to cover today, just quickly, and there's a lot behind this, you can imagine. So, questions are going to be important, and I'll I'll really skim across the surface. But the sort of documentation that we have in place already in preparation for incursions of emergency animal diseases, uh, what we do when an FMD is suspected in Australia, and the governance that um, with the decision making process there. The third thing is once FMD is confirmed or over, there's overwhelming evidence to indicate it's here, the National Livestock Standstill is put in place. And I'll talk a bit about that. And finally, the, the what we call stages two and three. So stage one is the National Livestock Standstill. Two and three is when we've confined the foot and mouth disease outbreak to a particular area and we can move on from that. Um, Regarding the, 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 the documents, this is a little bit of a boring part, but I thought it's quite worthwhile to give you some history to it. So we've actually, as a country, been preparing for this since 2002. The Emergency Animal Disease Response Agreement, or EADRA, commonly known as, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an agreement between all the governments of Australia, federal and state territory, and 14 industry bodies, including Australian dairy farmers. And it sets out some the very broad rules, I guess, around how we deal with emergency animal disease responses. And uh, it covers things like um, the funding formula, um, um, managing the response. It categorizes the diseases into one of four categories. So it covers 66 diseases that right across the animal industry. Category, category one diseases being the most important for human health because they are zoonotic, down to category four diseases, which are entirely funded in terms of um, by the government, by, by the industry, I'm sorry, in terms of uh, reaction. Underneath that sort of broad umbrella agreement are, are, is the OSVET plan, which sounds like a single plan, but it's actually a series of manuals uh, that are constantly developed and updated that cover the preferred approach to responding to an incursion. And the sort of manuals that I'm talking about here in relevance to the dairy sector are the FMD manual, for example, uh, response manual, the valuation and compensation manual, and the dairy enterprise manual that's currently in draft form. So you can go to the animal health web website there that I've written down the bottom to see the, the manuals. There's an enormous array of them. And uh, they, they focus, as the, as the name indicates, specifically on a particular component of the response. A number of us have been in Canberra this week to update the foot and mouth disease and the lumpy skin disease manuals. So they're constantly updated and these are managed by Animal Health Australia. So they really set the, set the scene and advise chief veterinary officers and others to uh, establish a response plan. And um, they certainly will, having, having done it preemptively, cut a lot of time and panic out of the process. So they've been in place a long time and we, we consider we're kind of as ready as we can be. I've just put here, this is a little hard to read, but it's kind of the decision-making process we, uh, that goes through when foot and mouth disease is suspected. And it, it starts with the sort of stuff Steph was indicating where you may see as a farmer, um, some symptoms that are suspect in some of your cattle. And the idea is to ring your local vet or get onto the, the uh, exotic, the emergency animal diseases hotline and report report that as soon as you see it. It's really, really important that reporting is done as soon as possible. And as Steph pointed out, a negative is great news and it's equally important. So we can uh, continue to underpin our freedom. But um, 
any, any delay, a day's delay in reporting can cost the industry millions overall. And some work done back in 2013 indicated that quite potentially the first report could be as much as 20 days into the infection being in Australia. So we want to shorten that period down to about nine or 10 days. So if you see anything suspicious, please proceed. Um, the, uh, the chief veterinary officer of your state of the jurisdiction will, will uh, start preparing for emergency disease response, will uh, orchestrate samples being collected and sent off to the laboratory down in Geelong at the what was the Australian Animal Health Laboratory and now is the Australian Centre for Disease Preparedness. Results come back and if confirmed, um, some a few things get clicked into place. There's a formation of a group called the CCEAD, which is the Consultative Committee for Emergency Animal Diseases, and that'll be the technical people who advise on where to go with um, from day one, uh, and then they pass that advice on to what's termed the National Management Group. And Australian Dairy Farmers represents the dairy sector on both those at different levels. We have vets already established to go on the CCEAD. And Rick, the chair of, uh, of ADF, and will we'll be sitting on the national management group to provide advice. They then consider whether uh, it, the uh, whether to call the national livestock standstill. And here's where it gets particularly interesting for the sector. Um, if it's confirmed, then or strongly suspected to be confirmed, uh, a national livestock standstill is called. Now, what does that mean? That's We call this stage one. So stage one is pre, is the very first thing to do, stop everything moving around the country. We then go to two and three, which I'll come to shortly, which is about, okay, we've got the disease established. We know where it is and we'll put some boundaries around, but I'll come to that. The idea of the standstill is to restrict the, the disease spreading, enable uh, trace, tracing. And you saw from Steph's um, table from Megan that uh, the amount of movement per day or per six days, you can imagine what that's been like for 20 days around the country. So it enables us to trace where the disease has come from and where animals have gone to and to find the extent of the infection. Um, it also gives the CVO and the CCAEAD that I've just described time to prepare the zoning uh, once they determine where the disease is. And there is a livestock in transit matrix that's applied. And obviously it's a very common question. What do I do with a national livestock standstill when I have animals on the road. And there's quite a complicated matrix um, and that's it. It's a little bit hard to read, but I'm just indicating the complexity of it. This was actually done in about 2012 and it's, a, it's due for, for, for revision, but it's, that is a guide for what you do when animals are going from source A to source B. But generally speaking, I, I would say for the dairy sector, if the journey is less than four hours, or they're beyond halfway into the journey, the intention is to continue the animals through to the point of destination and then shut down from there, but make sure records are kept for all that. So what we really want to do is, is, is halt the movement of livestock around the country uh, while, while we can sort out where the disease is because it's so infectious, it's so transmissible, we need to, we need to do this. Um, the National Livestock Standstill is called for 72 hours minimum. That's three days minimum. It can be and most likely would be extended beyond that period. Um, but 72 hours is most, is most likely, particularly in the states. It might even stop after 72 hours in states that are quite clearly shown to not have the disease. So what, are, what do you do as a dairy farmer in, an, in a national livestock standstill? You know, tomorrow, if it's called, what does it mean for you? Now, I've covered a couple of issues here. Steph's covered a few. It's quite a lot, of, lot to be involved with and certainly questions will cover, this, uh, we'll cover this in the question time. Number one, restrict livestock movements. But very importantly for dairies, milking will continue. It, it, we cannot assume that we can just stop milking over just like that. Clearly, it's a welfare issue. Milking continues, but you do need to put in place the biosecurity. Uh, one would hope you've got biosecurity in place now, but really ramp it up. And, and things like uh, restricting the effluent on public roads. Try to walk your animals down the side of the road rather than over the rather than along the road if you can, if it's a public road. Uh, Steph talked about tanker routes to tanker tracks on the farm. No, no cattle there, no manure there. Keep effluent away from that area. 
uh, allow and be aware of the need for tankers coming on board and, and off property to wash and disinfect, um, record all vehicle and people movements. This is part of your biosecurity planning, normally the biosecurity arrangement should be, but this needs to be ramped up. Only allow essential visitors on farm and use your property vehicle. So leave their vehicle at the front gate and only use yours to come on board and off. I noticed in one of the questions about uh, having different sets of clothing on farm from uh, on to off, and the answer would be yes, that'd be very, very sensible. Raw milk should never leave the farm. Uh, so, so if you are, um, uh, I'm sorry that I should qualify that. Raw milk should only be fed to calves on, on farm um, and, and observed by security practices. When I say milking continues under point one, clearly the tankers have to come in, collect and leave. Um, so you need to be aware that um, the tankers, tanker drivers may be instructed to alter their normal collection route. And, and that's, uh, that'll be a task for the processors and, and the tanker driver, the people who organize the tanker drivers to enable them to go to low risk properties first, finish at high risk and proceed to the factory thereafter. So milk will continue to be processed and, and indeed marketed. There's no harm from the milk for humans and there's got to be an outlet. If our foreign markets are closed, the domestic market becomes hugely important for us. And we've got to continue and send the right message to consumers that it's quite safe to consume. Uh, tankers will also be instructed not to fill to full, just to prevent spillage. The new modern tankers are pretty good at that anyway. The index property, and I call it that because we haven't established zones yet, uh, will most like will be quarantined, and so will those that surround it. So there'll be no milk collection from the index property, and unfortunately, we'd have to look at ways of disposing of the milk on farm there through treating first with acidification of some sort or whatever, and uh, disposing on farm. But ultimately, the chief veterinary officer is in charge of all this, and will announce when the national livestock standstill is over, and what restrictions apply thereafter. And here's the where we're coming into the uh, stages two and three. Okay, the standstill is now over. What does it mean for me as a dairy farmer? If, if the disease is in the Kimberley and I'm in Tasmania, clearly this, I won't be involved in, the, um, in, the, in these sort of areas, this response areas, but it is, you know, there's going to be some urgent need and hence the standstill to develop these kind of three zones, the restricted area, which I put a whole lot of acronyms in there. I'm not going to go through them. I've given you an example on the bottom left and bottom right of what those acronyms mean. There's a lot of different sort of uh, um, cr criteria given to each farm, at-risk premises, infected premises, dangerous contact premises, dangerous contact processing facility, all that sort of thing. These will be looked at by the chief veterinary officers and uh, they will determine livestock movements, which will be very strictly controlled and also milk movements. And, and that equates to, to what's in the restricted area going into the con control area, if anything at all, or the control area back to the restricted area, if anything at all, and particularly keeping that outside area clear. So as an example, uh, an infection in the Kimberley would be in the red area, that part of zoning, and Tasmania would be in the outside area or the green area. That's a massive simplification of what's out, what's required out there, but I just thought I'd give that a quick uh, summary so that you realize that after the standstill lifts, presuming the CVO makes that decision, this is now how it will be operated until we're clear of the disease. Stage three being disease under control, and then finally, hopefully disease eradicated. And just finally, uh, remember that all edible products from infected animals are safe to consume. No problem with that. We've already worked with Fazans to have preemptive statements. And in fact, it's on their website now. Uh, preemptive statements to say quite fine to eat and consume. Any, any control of the disease, any movement controls are only to restrict disease spread. And any slaughter of animals is nothing to do with consumer safety. It's only to move us to open trade again as soon as we can. And we, we're asking the Food Authority for Zans to do the same thing for LSD, livestock, uh, lumpy skin disease, because it's exactly the same situation there. Finally, ADF and Dairy Australia will represent your interests, but ultimately chief veterinary officers have the final say in all of this. But all dairy farmers have a role to play from now, right from now, as uh, Stephanie indicated, you need to enact your biosecurity plans. 
So that's it from me, Rick. I've left a few numbers on there. The Emergency Animal Disease Watch Hotline is very important. And of course, you, you'd be aware of the various um, web, web mail ad website addresses there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Justin. Um, a lot of complexity in that, as you say, but thanks for that, that top line summary of, of the situation in the event of a standstill. Um, listen, that's uh, now's the opportunity to address a number of the, the key questions that we've received throughout the, the webinar. And to help with this session, I'll hand over now to Ash Hammond, who's been monitoring the incoming questions. We'll highlight some of the common questions and, and themes that have been, <coughs> have been emerging that uh, hopefully the panel will be able to shine some light on. So over to you, Ash. Perfect. Thanks, Charlie. Um, so Chris, I'm going to start with you. Um, one of the most commonly asked questions that we've had <laughs> coming through the chat and obviously seen in, in social media and media is why, do, why doesn't the government shut borders with Indonesia until they get the outbreak under control? Because shutting the border is, is not a measure that's commensurate with the risk. Um, we've been dealing with countries that have FMD for many, many years, and we've had the safe movement of passengers and goods between those countries. The reason that Indonesia is a little bit different and the reason that we have had these various upticks in activity is because they've got an active infection on the way. Now, people go, why would you not just shut the border? Okay, fair call, uh, and, and it's a fair question. Only circumstances you'd think about shutting a border is, is one, if we are unable to cope with measures, um, that we're implementing at the border, and that's not the case because we are, and we've actually increased measures and increased staff. Or the second would be that Indonesia is making no effort, and it's just a rampant, uncontrolled exercise that's going on there with the disease going everywhere. That's also not the case. Although there's 400,000 animals infected, there's now over 600,000 vaccinated, and there's now a very active control program going on in Indonesia. Um, and I think that uh, they've now had a significant uptick since it's moved from the Department of Agriculture now to their Disaster Relief Agency. Um, and what we're seeing is a disease that is now, um, although it is still very active and we can remain very concerned, which is why we've kept those border measures in place, you need those two sets of circumstances met that I just described, and they're not met at the moment. Um, and what we're seeing is we're able to cope through the increased measures, including the introduction just this week of uh, foot mats, uh, citric acid foot mats at the border. And uh, I'm advised that uh, they have now been delivered to a couple of airports and will be installed in the next day or so. So as we see practical measures that make sense, they're being implemented. Um, and, and that's the way that we've been managing the disease, as well as continuing to assist Indonesia in their control efforts, as well as ensuring that what's happening post-border is in the best possible space. Great. Thank you. Um, Steph, I'll put this next one to you. Should dairy farmers be supplying gumboots and wet weather gear for, for example, relief milkers to be used solely on, on their individual farm? Yeah, it's a great, great question, Ash. And uh, the answer is yes. So wherever possible, if you can have uh, your own set of clothing and footwear for your farm, uh, that's really good practice. Um, and again, simple things like providing gloves. Uh, we all know that gloves are much easier to take off and throw in the bin uh, on farm rather than trying to wash hands. Um, the other thing is, as I said, it's really important to have uh, both visitors to your farm complete a risk assessment, but also um, your farm staff. So um, things like owning, um, you know, uh, susceptible animals at home, et cetera, can increase the risk. Um, so it's really about identifying, you know, what is the what is the potential biosecurity risk around these people and what are some of the things that we can put in place to really try and minimise the risk. And yeah, as I said, um, own set of, of uh, boots and, and clothing that, that stay on farm um, is a really, really good Good suggestion. Perfect. Thank you. And another one while I've got you here, how should farmers be disposing of their foot bath liquid when they're refreshing? Yeah, it's a great question, Ash. I haven't got uh, any general advice really, other than to say it's really important to read the label. Um, so I was just having a quick flick through um, some of the labels sort of uh, while Justin was finishing his presentation. Most of them talk just mostly about avoiding waterways um, being the most important thing. Um, but I will take that question on notice, Ash, and if it's something that people want to know about, I'll uh, do some more digging and try and find some general advice and, and pop that up on the EAD page. 
Perfect, thank you. Um, now over to you, Justin. How far is the surround um, of the index property? So where FND is first identified in the case of an incursion. And if you are that, that property where it's first identified um, with foot and mouth disease, does this change what would happen for you during a livestock standstill? Uh, the, it's hard to answer definitively the, the surrounds. It's really over to the chief veterinary officers' uh, uh, staff and the chief CVO. So there'll be on-site visits and there'll be checking of neighbouring farms. But of course, it's really hard if you are an index property to lock the virus in within your within your gate. So, so sadly, it would be a group of properties around probably that would be affected. Um, in terms of how, of how it affects you as a, as a producer, if you're an index property, um, there's no collection of milk on your property. Clearly, we don't want the disease to spread, so tankers wouldn't be visiting. Uh, I would suggest that there'd be maximum biosecurity requirements on that farm, uh, top-level hygiene, uh, and as I mentioned in my presentation, destruction of milk. Uh, through uh, and denaturing of the virus, if possible, and that's often done through acidification. Um, how you destroy the, the milk on farm is is an important consideration. Um, and I would, as part of the preparation for potentially an FMD incursion, have farmers just investigate how, what options are available to them for two things, as sad as it is. One is the destruction of milk on farm, and the second would be uh, destruction and disposal of carcasses on farm should that event arise let's hope not but it just should be part of their pr preparation absolutely thank you um oh sorry and also keep records because in many respects you know that uh, we, we come to compensation eventually you need record keeping of yep. instructions thanks Okay, thanks. And while I've got you as well, Justin, I just want you to, there's been a few queries and I know livestock standstill is obviously something people are very interested in. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can repeat, there was a comment you made or you described with regards to animals being on the road for less than four hours um, into the journey, uh, less than halfway, like just the comment around um, what should people be doing if they're on the road for less than or more than four hours? Yeah, it's it's it's... It's again, not definitive. None of this is definitive, but there is that matrix set up that I did flash up for a brief moment that was established in 2012 as a means of trying to get some definitive uh, answers to that exact question. That matrix is being reviewed. Um, it's, it's, it's much more fluid now, I suppose, but it's, it, it is essentially around number one, controlling the disease, number two, being conscious of the welfare of the animals and number three, being conscious of the welfare of the drivers and, and, the, and the people involved. Um, and it may well be that uh, it's better to move the cattle continually onto the destination as part of the disease control and then lock them in there and just note that uh, in the trace, in, in tracing, tracing records that that's where they've gone rather than turn them around and go back, particularly if the trucks have multiple um, consignments on board, they can't go back through multiple properties to deliver. That's just not going to be allowed. Yep. So it is it is difficult for the truck drivers who are sitting on the side of the road and knowing what to do. My suggestion was if you are actually physically a truck driver and had to pull over because you've heard on the radio or somebody's rung and said stop, get onto your um, get onto the authorities as quickly as you can and tell them where you are. I think there'd be instruction given fairly quickly to get them moving. Great. Thanks, Justin. Um, Chris, back to you. So how long, if, if there's a suspected case of FMD in Australia, how long does it take to test that animal? Um, and just another one I have seen coming up a lot and it has come through the chat as well. Is there a shortage of vets in regional Australia to respond to an outbreak? Um, so it's... It's impossible for me to answer both of those questions. The first question, how long does it take to get someone? Well, if you've got a sick animal, you should call your vet. That vet will come and test. If they've got a suspicion it's a it's an exotic disease, they it's 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 um, uh, by law they have to notify, right? And that sample would go off if it's FMD, probably to uh, the lab in Geelong, um, and that'd be facilitated through whichever state department of agriculture. Um, you know, realistically. It would take longer to get a diagnosis in the far north than what it might do is if you're a dairy farmer and uh, in Victoria where the lab is in Geelong. Um, I mean, that's just the realities of distance. So it's very hard, Ash, for me to go, that will be the time frame exactly, other than 
it would be done as quickly as physically possible um, because it's a notifiable disease and it would require that to go on. The second question is, uh, is a far more problematic and you're talking, you know, I'm a veterinarian, I've worked in, uh, in rural mixed practice uh, and, and did so for a number of years. Um, what, what I do know is, is um, that we've been speaking with the, uh, with, uh, the cattle veterinarians I was speaking with just earlier in the week and they're getting a, sim, uh, a symposium together where they'll have 300 vets. Um, we'll be looking at, um, I think, um, over time, certainly as part of the preparedness plans, the activities we do around um, where we may be able to source vets. And there'll be a number of sources of those. Our own department's the largest employer of vets. Um, we've got a whole lot of people who are working in abattoirs who have a, uh, as in vets in abattoirs, who have a significant role and they are a significant workforce uh, that we can use. Um, so again, it's quite a hard question to ask and answer in a definitive sense, other than um, there are a number of resource pools that we know are there and a number of resource pools that we would use in the event um, of uh, if, if something was to occur, Ash. Great. Thank you. Now, I do know we've just gone on 1 p.m., um, but I think we will continue this conversation for a little while longer. We've still got nearly a thousand people online um, and we know how important this is. So we don't usually do this, but we will take it um, for a few minutes over. If anyone needs to drop off now, feel free to. And obviously the recording will be available um, on the Dairy Australia website afterwards. So, um, Chris, back to you. We've had a lot of questions coming through around vaccination. So will the FMD vaccine be readily available for Australia when it's needed, if it's needed, sorry? And why is Australia not proactively vaccinating cattle now for mouth disease? So there's two components of that. The first is, is around vaccine. Um, we have uh, a, a vaccine bank, which is held in the UK. That vaccine bank can produce a million doses of vaccine that would be available in the country in seven days. So that's, that's in the bank, if you like, and it's there to use. The contract said it will be made up and we can instigate that contract if and when we see fit. There's, the, the, there is a quite, a, uh, I suppose, a simple reason why we do not prophylactically start vaccinating cattle for foot and mouth disease, and that's to do with trade. There are three, essentially three statuses that you have in the world as a country for trading. The first would be you have foot and mouth disease. You can't really trade with too many countries um, in regard to uh, 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 animal products. And for a country like Australia, where 70% of the animal products produced are exported, that would be a significant problem. The second category is your FMD free with vaccination. That allows you to get to a few more countries, but still not very many. And that would be the status if we started to vaccinate. We would lose market access to a whole range of very large markets. And of course, the third status is FMD free, which is what we are. FMD free, no vaccination, no requirement. Outside of the fact that if we started to vaccinate for FMD, we'd have a whole lot of trading partners going, what are you vaccinating for FMD for? Like, you guys don't have it, do you? And so suddenly we would probably fall into a, you've got FMD status and countries would close markets on us just out of suspicion. So to prophylactically do it, fundamentally changes our trading status and fundamentally affects the range of markets that we can export to and would essentially, I think, in the initial stages at least, have a similar effect as if you had the disease. Great. Okay, thank you. Justin, you've got your hand up. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, just additional to Chris's mm -hmm. appropriate comments there is that uh, FMD is not just FMD. It's like the flu. It's like saying the flu is the flu. There are a number of strains of FMD. Uh, and you need to have the right vaccine for the right strain. And so this is the point about having it strain type very, very quickly at the, at the Geelong Laboratory. So we know what vaccine to order from our bank within the UK. We've got quite a, a, a myriad of, of strains there. And we do have a set there that's, that is, is uh, appropriate for the Indonesian strain, but, but a, a, quite apart from the very sensible stuff that Chris has just indicated, we wouldn't know which strain to prophylactically use. Thank you. Um, and Justin, while I've got you, you might be able to answer this one, the incubation period of FMD. So if you um, if you suspect you've got it, how long might your cattle have been infected or before they were symptomatic? Said, said to be three to eight days. Um, so, but there's some buffer, you know, when, when we're building in things like, um, one thing we didn't discuss today, for example, was uh, germplasm. If, you know, so embryos and semen, if you were a farmer wanting to retain the, the bloodline that you've been working so hard to establish, it would be quite wise to be putting aside your own 
frozen embryos and semen, uh, and, or whatever you choose, if it's appropriate for you. Because the fact is that you can't use, if we were to have an incursion, you won't be able to use germplasm that's anything younger than 28 days prior to that incursion or, or you know, finding of the disease, because it could be harbored within that uh, incubation period. So we, when, we, when we're developing these programs, we kind of look at two incubation periods plus a little bit just to be on the safe side, but generally three, three to eight days. Great. Thank you. Um, Steph, I think this one for you. So how do farms who have cattle that have to cross roads, um, how could they, you know, what could they do to minimise the spread during an incursion? Um, and what extra kind of precautions could be taken? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Ash, um, and probably one I can't answer specifically. There's so many different situations. Um, I did see a couple of uh, comments in the chat just coming through around underpass subsidies and things like that. I know underpasses are extremely expensive um, and not always practical if, you know, your neighbouring property is a, a lease farm, for example. So, um, look, the, the critical thing... Um, uh, is is really trying to minimise the kind of the the distribution of manure and things like that on on vehicles etc. Um, I think by having a sort of really strict farm biosecurity plan, looking for alternatives where possible, um, and, and really you know ensuring that all vehicles are clean um, before coming onto your farm um, is probably the the best that you can do in the first instance. And again, like the other question, Ash, I've been really focused on um on you know making sure that we've got visitor risk assessment templates etc um a lot of these questions that are popping up um i'll do more and and uh i, I want to let everyone know um that's got questions like this that you know we'll be coming up with more information to to try and troubleshoot some of the practical solutions to this um to these sort of dilemmas because I, I mean certainly for our farm we, we we've got cows that cross the road too so um yeah we'll we'll absolutely um do some more digging on that and um and let you know great um, thanks, Steph. So, Justin, back to you again. If there is a livestock standstill, um, will a farmer still be able to buy feed from another farmer? Will they be able to pick up um, pick up that fodder and bring it back to their own farm? Um, yeah, the standstill applies to to livestock only. Um, so, just that three day period, it, it is a it is a, I suppose, a channel for risk. But uh, we have to assume those first three days some things may still have to occur. The better option clearly is in preparation would be for producers to have some feed on farm that will last them the three days plus. And so they reduce the risk. I mean, what, what we would ask of farmers during the standstill quite clearly is to, to reduce their movements to as little as possible. And that would include the movement of feed. Okay, thanks Justin. And again, while I've got you, um... Can you touch on, oh, sorry, I lost my questions, um, but it's around compensation. So, you know, if you have to um, cull your entire herd, can yeah. you just touch on the specific compensation um, in the outro? Yeah, uh, so to the extent that the culling is part of the disease control and eradication program, we've had pre-approval for compensation to be paid for the livestock that are slaughtered. And this goes for semen and embryos in that sort of window period as well. And what it, it's a little complicated, but there is a manual, as I mentioned, all the manuals, one of them was for compensation, it's all described in there in great formulas and such, but essentially it's um, the most recent sale is used as the guide for the first compensation payment to the producers for like for like animals. Uh, but there are two tranches of, of compensation, so that's not it, you don't, don't just get paid first based on the most recent sale because the market's been depressed obviously because of the infection. And so uh, you get that first tranche and then when FMD is cleared in your area and you're allowed to restock, you then like for like want to replace those animals and you get a top up payment that takes the compensation up to the level of the animal's total swap over. So in other words, you're not out of pocket in respect of replacing your animals. But as I say, it's quite a complicated formula there. There's no compensation for anything within the EADRA there's no compensation for anything other than livestock and the germplasm. So there's no compensation for lost production of milk or lost income from milk and so on. That's another issue. Okay, 
Thanks, Justin. I'm conscious now we've gone nine plus one, so this will be um, our last question. So I think Chris and or Justin can respond to this one. Um, so we have had a couple of questions come through just with regards to the strict eradication policy um, for foot and mouth disease. You know, we've got other diseases, so equine influenza, Hendra, anthrax, um, and for that, it's it's not that eradication policy. Um, you know, stop movement, implement other biosecurity protocols. So the question is whether or not culling potentially both sick and healthy animals is still um, the most appropriate way to respond to foot and mouth disease. So, um, Justin, I'm happy to take that. I think probably um, it depends on the circumstances, Ash, and thanks for the question, because I think it's it's a really useful question for us to think about, because if we have it at um, a, a small outbreak in a single state, culling may well be the most sensible epidemiological decision to restore markets as quickly as possible. If we were to use vaccine as well, the restoration of markets takes quite a bit longer because you've used vaccine, you've got to identify them, you then have to go through a series of how you manage that. So you, you fall into that status about FMD free with vaccination rather than FMD free. Um, and so I think it's very much dependent on the size of the outbreak whether it's multi-state, whether there are large numbers of different infected properties, um, IPs in each of those places. Because if you did have a large outbreak, then clearly vaccination forms an important component of it. But our return to markets would be much slower. So I think it's very much, uh, uh, if you like, scenario dependent. Um, and in certain circumstances, I think there would be a very strong case for euthanasia of um, animals to be the most effective way to deal with it. But in other cases, there may not be as strong a case. And of course, as I was pointing out today, because there's a, a large meeting with Effect Emergency uh, Management Australia and all the uh, jurisdictions to try and socialise this issue a bit, folks. So it's not just us Aggies who have to manage it. Um, we get the assistance we need from the emergency management folk. And we talk there about whether there's even social licence these days for uh, for large numbers of animals to be culled and disposed of in, in what will be quite public view. So I think a lot of that will come into the fore at the time, um, but I think there are circumstances where, yes, it would be good, other circumstances where maybe not a stronger case can be made. And Ash, um, to add, um, FMD causes production losses, causes through the morbidity that was described by Chris earlier on, and indeed mortality, with carbs, quite high mortality rates in calves. But the bigger issue for us is about the trade. The world the world trades in two spheres, one FMD-free sphere and one FMD sphere. And um, in order to be in the, the nice half, which, which we've enjoyed for 200 years, you need to follow the, the World Health, the World Organization for Animal Health rules, uh, which Chris has just described. And so it's a bigger, it's a, it's a bigger decision than just for us. But it's a it's a world decision. Right. Thanks, Justin. And David, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Ash. I think it'd also be worth pointing out to everybody who's listening that this is an issue around when we uh, when we discuss matters around um, uh, mass cullings of this nature, farmer welfare, of course, and farmer well-being is a really important component here. And this has been discussed several times with the government over recent weeks. And in fact, uh, ADF has raised it with the minister now a couple of times and the government is acutely aware that that needs to be a key part of the response. It's not just obviously around managing the disease, which is the immediate and primary focus, but we're acutely aware that supporting farmers through that as well is uh, needs to be happening in parallel to the disease eradication. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you all. Um, so we'll wrap up the questions there. Back over to you, Charlie. Thanks very much, Ash, and um, thanks for all those questions. Listen, unfortunately, that's all we have time for. Um, but rest assured, we've documented all of the 138 questions that have come in um, and where possible, we'll ensure that answers to those questions will be made available on that emergency animal disease preparedness web page that we, uh, we highlighted earlier on. So please note again that the webinar has been recorded. We'll circulate a link to the, uh, the recording shortly um, to everyone who's registered for the webinar. So thanks all to our panellists. Thanks everyone for attending. We really appreciate um, you taking the time out to get across this really important issue. 
and we'll continue to keep you informed as new information emerges on this on this critical area. So thanks very much, everyone. See you later.